Hello, my name is Reba Gujon, and today I'm joined by Scott Stewart, and we are nearing the launch of ThreatLens, a big news drop for offering coming up in September. And, you know, I'm really excited about this. I think a number of our, our clients are as well, where we have the opportunity now to meld the core geopolitical framework that our analysts have in forecasting major world events and layering on top of that this protective security lens. Yeah, and and I think that that's a a thing that, you know, we've obviously covered terrorism and security issues, you know, for for many years now. But one of the nice things with Threat Lens, it allows us to to amplify that. Mm -hmm. uh, But of course, still being married to the rest of Stratfor. And and that really gives us a strength of what we do because it allows us to tie together the overarching geopolitical frameworks and even, you know, the, the smaller regional dynamics we're looking at with these more tactical security and terrorism issues. Absolutely. So let's take the opportunity kind of hit a few spots on the globe and and just kind of see how those two layers actually intersect. So U.S. Russia, that's obviously been a major trend that we've been following for some time now in this enduring standoff, a lot of distrust underpinning that relationship. And cybersecurity is a major component to it, right? We track all of these complex negotiations from Syria to Ukraine, where there there can be some give and take between Moscow and Washington, but a major battle space is in the cybersecurity realm. How do you see that Russian threat evolving? Well, one of the interesting things I, I think is that it's it's also there's been a crossover between just pure cybersecurity, mm-hmm. but we're also seeing it start to mesh in with other wet operations uh, that, that, that wet Russian operations intelligence refer to basically like dirty jobs. Okay. Uh, whether that's you know assassination type stuff, kidnapping stuff, uh, you know other other types of uh, you know propaganda and, and dirty deeds. Mm-hmm. So we're really starting to see a, a, an overlay of that, and and the Russians have been very aggressive, not just in assassination operations like we've seen in places like Washington, D.C. and London, mm-hmm. um, but, but we've seen them now, you know, enter the, the political forum uh, with, with the DNC releases. We've seen them really fire a shot across the bow of the NSA uh, with, with some of these uh, latest releases. So the, the Russians have been very aggressive and, uh, you know, it, it, it spans the globe. So we're seeing them not only hacking, we're seeing them kill people and, and using uh, you know both of those tools together. And you know what's interesting is as we're watching Russian vul- vulnerabilities increase internally in the lead up to September legislative elections in Russia, and then even beyond that, as we see this power struggle within the Kremlin escalate, most recently with the big fall of Ivanov and mm-hmm. more to follow from that, um, Russia, I'm sure, is feeling and anticipating some degree of, of, of blowback from this, as the United States is also looking at Russian political vulnerabilities and potentially opportunities to exploit, um, which I think explains a lot of the Russian internal security measures we're seeing to try to preempt. Well, exactly. Like like the uh, the new counterterrorism bill they passed in, in July, which is really an opportunity for them to declare anyone uh, who dissents against the regime to be a terrorist. Uh, so, and, and there's a lot of implications there, not just for dissidents and journalists, but I think there's also potential blowback there for businessmen, uh, people who get in the way of, of the Kremlin's economic plans, mm-hmm. um, or, or even NGO workers, uh, religious workers, people who are seen to be a threat to the Orthodox Church. So there's a lot of big implications there internally for people inside Russia, as well as the external global uh, issues. So then let's jump to an area where Russia is deeply involved in the Middle East, and we see Russia using the Syrian battlefield as a sort of negotiating platform with the United States. And it's had some successes, but Mm. still is facing quite a few obstacles there. Um, But as we see the the fight against Islamic State, which Russia uses as its sort of platform for cooperation with the United States as it's trying to get the U.S. to cooperate on other areas closer to the former Soviet periphery, um, the fight against Islamic State itself, though, is... A slow moving one, um, much to the annoyance of many U.S. politicians here. Right. Um, But we are seeing the degradation of Islamic State conventional capabilities. And as we see things, you noted this week with the the Turkish suicide bombing employing an adolescent uh, bomber 
that is it's not a sign of strength right from the islamic mm -hmm. state it, it could be more of a sign of weakness yeah o overall we've really seen the constriction mm -hmm. uh fr from all sides really of, of the islamic state both in iraq and syria having an impact mm -hmm. uh, it's having an impact on their ability to pay their fighters it's having an impact on their ability to get foreign fighters into the region and that of, of course is limiting uh the number of suicide bombers that they're able to to recruit locally plus they've just had tremendous losses and so they are really uh, going to, I think we're going to see a repeat of, of what we kind of saw in 2007, 2008 in Iraq. As uh, you know, the Islamic State in Iraq was weakening, mm -hmm. we saw them starting to employ more children. We saw a, a huge spike in the number of female suicide bombers as a lot of the wives of the fighters decided to kill themselves rather than be captured. Uh, we even saw them use you know, mentally disabled people mm -hmm. uh, as bombers. So I think we're gonna see them get that desperate again uh, as they begin to scrape the bottom of the barrel um, and as they retrench from their power uh, bases in Iraq and Syria. And a more desperate Islamic State can actually mean more of a danger, um, even when we look at grassroots operations hitting Europe. So how do you see that threat evolving as we see this degradation of Islamic State capabilities? Well, now with, with Jarabalus falling, mm -hmm. uh, that's really going to cut the rat lines of foreign fighters to the Islamic State proper. Mm -hmm. So that means a lot of the people in Europe and elsewhere that would like to f come and fight in the Islamic State are not going to be able to get there. So that means they're more likely to uh, attack at home. Plus, we're also likely to see an exodus of foreign fighters from Iraq and Syria as those get constructed. I mean, as the Islamic State goes from ruling areas back to kind of guerrilla warfare and insurgency, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's harder to hide the foreign fighters than it is the locals. They they just stick out mm -hmm. and they're, they're more easily swept up by the security forces. So a lot of them are, are going to leave and return to their countries of origin where they're going to pose a threat. The, the good news is most of them don't have uh, you know, high degrees of terrorist tradecraft. So we're going to probably see a continuation of these more simple attacks, you know, using guns, small bombs, uh, even vehicles, mm -hmm. you know, other other uh, you know knives, axes, uh, very simple attacks. But uh, they can still kill people, and and it's going to continue to be a threat, uh, really, for the foreseeable future. And that in turn just feeds this cycle of right wing extremism in the political um, picture within Europe, which of course is feeding into the fragmentation trend that we've been tracking. Absolutely, it's all interrelated. And and so as we look at another country in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, where I know there's a lot of corporate security interest, especially as the Saudi kingdom is embarking on this very ambitious economic diversif diversification plan and is trying to reassure investors that, you know, that all is still safe in the kingdom. But that blowback you were speaking of, mm. of militants returning home. Um, that does not spell good news for the Saudi kingdom. No, absolutely. And and I mean, if you look at just the numbers uh, that we've seen published by some of the people that have done studies on foreign fighters, there really has been a very high number of Saudis mm -hmm. uh, that have traveled to fight with the Islamic State. And then, of course, you also have the Saudi links to Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, you know, the the, uh, the Al-Qaeda brand out, out of Yemen. So there really is a lot of, of militancy in that area that can impact Saudi Arabia. There again, fortunately for the Saudis, most of these people don't have a high degree of, of terrorist tradecraft, but we're still seeing them embark in these low-level mosque bombings, mm -hmm. low-level firearms attacks. So it's going to continue to be, uh, there again, a simmering issue for the Saudis as well. And of course, as the Hajj comes in to play uh, over this next month, I'm sure we're going to see a Spike in attacks against uh, you know non Sunnis, especially Shias, uh, you know, and, and other kind of uh, you know sects of, of Islam that come for the Hajj. Mm -hmm. And so, jumping to another region altogether, uh, Latin America. Um, where again, we do see a lot of investor interest and, and certainly a lot of potential when we look at a place like Colombia, mm. um, which today uh, FARC and the government are signing their peace agreement. Of course, there are further steps to be taken here on um, if and when the government actually takes this to a public vote, um, further questions on amnesty and things like that. But from the corporate security point of view, what do we need to be watching for in Colombia as we still see lingering threats? Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, one of the things that we, we need to understand, we have this glut 
of, of men uh, who know how to use guns mm-hmm. and, and really don't have a lot of other job skills. And so we've seen it in other parts of the region, uh, really El Salvador, for example, Guatemala, other places, that when you've had a demobilization of a guerrilla force, even in Colombia with the AUC earlier, mm-hmm. um, you know, you end up with Bakrim uh, coming out of the AUC, these, these criminal bands. Uh, so I think we're going to see a similar phenomenon out of the FARC. Uh, you know, a lot of the political leaders are educated. Um, they kind of have more of a future, mm-hmm. but the rank and file people really don't have much uh, job opportunities at, at this point. And so really it's going to be easiest for them to continue on in crimes. Mm-hmm. I also believe that we're going to see some splinter factions yeah. uh, from the communist groups, also the ELN. And actually we even have, uh, you know, some of the FARC fronts uh, are balking, like the first and the seventh at, at the peace process as well. Uh, so I think we may have some communist holdouts. And so as we see some of those remnants of FARC and ELN look for something to do, I'm sure we're going to see some of that fallout in Venezuela as well, which is another country um, that, uh, you know, is is spiraling to a great degree. And I think a lot of outsiders, potentially, you know, also investors are looking at this and just waiting for Venezuela to implode and then see a pro-Western government come in and see itself sort out. But I I don't think that's at all the scenario that we see in Venezuela, given these entrenched security concerns in the country. Um, And I I still think we see a very negative investment climate there overall. Yeah, no, I I agree with you. And and I mean, the the security problems there are going to continue, especially when you think of these armed militia groups, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in in these very poor neighborhoods, they're going to continue to be a very influential force and potentially a very strong, uh, not not only you know insurgent type force, but but criminal force, mm-hmm. uh, if, if there is is a turn. So it, it's going to be a long a long road ahead for Venezuela before things would stabilize. Yeah, all the parties that are basically trying to manage some sort of transition also have to be dealing with those parties with linkages to very powerful prison gangs, for example, and militia groups. And so as those interests are addressed, um, that just means that they have staying power, um, which is in a post-Maduro Venezuela as well. I wish we could keep covering different parts of the world, Scott, but um, we'll be covering a lot more in the upcoming Threat Lens offering. So we're looking forward to that. Thank you for joining me today. And thank you all for joining us.